Hello. Welcome to Reading Paul's Mail. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus is our example. Jesus is the one we're to pattern our lives after. And he came as a servant. He told his disciples, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We said the whole point of the gospel is being transformed from the image of Adam into the image of Christ. And this is a picture of the image of Christ. This is what Christ is about. He's about serving others according their needs. So that what that means for us is that the strong is to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, yesterday we talked about the definition of strong and weak. The strong person in faith is the person who is familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit. He knows how to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. He knows how to discern the Holy Spirit's voice. And he is led by the Spirit. He walks in the Spirit and doesn't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The person who's weak in faith requires more external rules. They need the rules written down, told them ahead of time, okay, here's the rules. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. That is described by the Apostle Paul as a person with weak faith. Why? Because that person needs law. He needs a law over him instead of being led by the Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Remember, the law is not the source of our righteousness. Observing the law is not the source of our righteousness. The source of our righteousness is faith in Jesus Christ. So the strong person is to bear with the failings of the weak. And the scriptures teach us that we should receive endurance through the things we're going through and also encouragement from the scripture as we walk with God. Let's take a look at that. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And that's what happens to us as believers a lot of times. The reproaches that people would have against Jesus, if he were right here now in the flesh, in our midst, there would be people opposing him now, just like there was people opposing him way back then. But since he is not here physically in the flesh, but he is in us, through the Holy Spirit, and we are in him, then the reproaches that would fall on him, those are the same reproaches that fall on us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things happen to us because we belong to Jesus. For whatever is written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Listen, we are called to endure. Living for the Lord in this life, living for the Lord in this world is not a walk in the park. It's not all butterflies and flowers and sing song and and cotton candy and, 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 you know, stuff like that. There are some difficult times we have to go through walking with the Lord in this world. Paul said we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. And that's what he's talking about here when he says the scriptures teach us endurance and encouragement. How? How is it encouraging? Because we can read the stories of people who lived in the past, people of faith, people who lived by faith, who lived in the past, and how God took care of them. God provided for them. God helped them. And that can be an encouragement to us for whatever difficulties we might be going through at this present time. We have endurance and encouragement of the scriptures. And the goal of all of this is that we will have the same voice. We will speak together in unity as members of the body of Christ. It says here, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance, listen to that. God is a God of endurance. God means for you to endure. And if you thought that turning to the Lord and living for the Lord was going to be easy, somebody sold you the wrong story. (laughs) That's not what it's like at all. God is a God of endurance, but he's also a God of encouragement. Not only does he tell us to, to endure, but he gives us encouragement along the way. 
May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. Who's one another? That's us. That's the members of the body of Christ. That's why we're not supposed to be criticizing each other. That's why we're not supposed to be judging each other. That's why we're not supposed to be despising each other. Because we're supposed to be one body. We're supposed to be one family. We're supposed to be members of one another in the agape of God. And we're supposed to be encouraging one another, not criticizing and finding fault with one another. That isn't the spirit of Jesus. I'll tell you what, if you know somebody who's critical, has always has a critical spirit and is always judgmental, that person is not operating in the spirit of God. Now, they may like to think of themselves as some kind of a self-righteous Old Testament prophet booming from the mountain or whatever but they're deceived we're not to despise one another we're not to criticize one another we're not to be pointing the finger at one another we're to be encouraging one another we're we're to have harmony live in such harmony with one another in accord with christ jesus that together that's all of us together all of us in the body of christ together with one voice We glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one voice. Give praise and glory to him. That's what we're called to do. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Listen, how did Christ welcome you? Did he, uh, did he, um, (laughs) did he have spiritual fact checkers at the door to make sure that you measured up before he let you in, before he accepted you into his body? Did he do that to you? How did the Lord accept you how did the lord receive you well it's an obvious answer but i'm not going to say it receive one another the same way that christ received you accept one another welcome one another as christ has welcomed you for the glory of god for i tell you that christ became a servant to the circumcised to show god's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs so what's he talking about here Well, he's talking about those two audiences I told you about from the very beginning. Paul is speaking to the Jew first because of the promises given to Abraham. And if you trace the history of the story of Christ, it goes from Adam to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, from Abraham to David, and from David to Christ. And that is the lineage. If you go back and read the Gospels, it talks about tracing Jesus being the son of Abraham, being the son of David, being the son of God. That's the gospel. Moses isn't in that mix anywhere because righteousness does not come through the law. The law makes us conscious of sin. Righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So Christ came to the Jew first to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. All right. Then it says, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So Christ came to the Gentiles. He came to the Jews first, then he came to the Gentiles. He came to the Jews first to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. Then he came to the Gentiles that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. In other words, the message the Gentiles should be hearing from of the gospel is not doom and gloom it's the message of god's mercy hey listen today is the day of god's favor today is the day of god's mercy today is the day of salvation you can come to know god you can experience the knowledge of god that's the gospel that you might know him hallelujah so christ comes to the gentiles so they they might glorify god for his mercy and then that the gentiles might receive christ jesus as lord everything that's been happening through the old testament through the new testament has been to bring god's kingdom to earth to bring the rule of god to earth the scripture says that he came to his own and his own received him not but to as many as received the him to those who believed in his name to them gave he power authority exousia to become the sons of of God. And so Christ came to the Gentiles so that they might receive authority. They didn't have the authority before. In the time of Moses, in the time of the law, they didn't have the authority to become a son of God. They had to go through the door of Judaism first. They had to become proselytes to Judaism. If they were men, they had to be circumcised in their flesh, and they had to uh, to be, be committed 
to observing the law of Moses. But that's not how it works in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you don't come through Moses to come to Christ. You come to Christ directly through faith. And God gives you the gift of righteousness through faith. He credits your faith as righteousness. But whoever you are, whether Jew or Gentile, no matter which one you are, all of us must receive Christ Jesus as Lord. Listen, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the rightful ruler of heaven and earth. I'm going to say that again. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the rightful ruler of heaven and earth. How come? Number one, because he is God. He owns and he created everything that exists. So the planet, the solar system, the universe, the stars, the plants, the minerals, he owns it all. Why? Because he created it. So it all belongs to him. He came and became a man, sharing in our humanity so that we could share in his spirituality. He came so that we might belong to him, so that we would be called to be saints and transferred out of the likeness of Adam into the likeness of the Son. And so he is the ruler of heaven and earth, and everyone needs to receive him. Not only as Savior, they need to receive him as Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Jesus Christ came to the Gentiles to rule over the Gentiles and give them the hope of eternal life. And remember what we said earlier, how Jesus defined eternal life. Eternal life is not length of life. It's not living forever. Everyone is going to exist somewhere forever. Every human being who's ever been conceived, once they are conceived, once they're born, they are going to live somewhere forever. It's not a question of if, it's a question of where. But eternal life is not just living forever. Eternal life is according to Jesus, is knowing you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is eternal life, the knowledge of the one true God and his Son. That is eternal life. And when does it begin? It begins as soon as you believe on the name of the Son of God. As soon as you believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to be an heir of of eternal life. You begin the process of being transformed out of the image of Adam and transformed into the image of the Son so that you can have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can walk in the Holy Spirit in this life. The grace of God will teach you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, and you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you will walk in the Spirit. You will hear the Holy Spirit you will be led by the Holy Spirit, and eventually you will enter into the presence of the Lord. That is the hope of our salvation. That's the hope that Jesus came to give to the Gentiles. So let's go back to our scriptures. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that was the Jews, the Israelites, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. See, that's a reference to Jesus being the descendant of David according to the flesh. Remember in our first episode, Paul was... In, was uh, introducing himself in his letter, and he talked about how he was coming to bring them the gospel of God, the gospel of God concerning his son, who according to the flesh was a descendant of David. That's what it's referring to here when it talks about the root of Jesse. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentile, rule the Gentiles. That's where I got this right here. Christ came to the Gentiles to rule over the Gentiles. Listen to that. Think about that. 
Christ came to the Gentiles to rule over the Gentiles. Jesus didn't come to pay, pay, play patty cake. Jesus didn't come to say, oh, please, 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 won't you accept me? Oh, please, 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 please accept me. Oh, don't reject me. No, 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 don't reject me. He came to rule over the Gentiles, and he is going to rule over the Gentiles, but he's going to give them hope. Hallelujah. You ever felt like you didn't have any hope in this world? Well, if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you can have hope, and you will have hope in Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. And then Paul, this is a prayer, really. <clears throat> Paul says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Oh, hallelujah. God wants you to fill, be filled with all joy and hope in believing. If you claim to know Jesus, if you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and you have no joy and you have no hope, then you're not walking in the Holy Spirit. You're not walking by faith. You're walking in some other way, and you're not relying upon him. You're not trusting him. See, that's what faith is. Faith is believing God exists and believing that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when you have living faith in God, you believe that he exists and you diligently seek him. You seek him. You don't seek the things of this life. You don't th see seek the things of this world. You seek him. And he says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. And when you seek him with all of your heart, the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So if you don't have that joy and you don't have that peace, but you claim to know the Lord, you need to examine your heart. And there's no condemnation. We already read that. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So if I find myself not walking as I should at any point in my life, in my relationship with God, I'm not cast out. I'm not rejected. I'm not denied. I just need to get myself straightened out. <laughs> I need to come back to the cross. I, my mom and the old, the old saints used to say it this way. You need to get back under the drippings of the sanctuary. You need to come back to the cross. You need to come back to the blood of Jesus. You need to ask Jesus to apply his blood to your spirit and to your soul and to your mind and to cleanse you from your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to forgive you, and he will. He's faithful and just. He provided one sacrifice for all time for all people. You don't have to present your own sacrifice. All you have to do is come back to his sacrifice and put your trust and faith in him. Call upon the name of the Lord. Boldly come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help you in your time of need. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and then the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing listen friends don't hide from God don't hide from God don't be so embarrassed and ashamed of whatever it is you have done or whatever it is you failed to do don't be so embarrassed and ashamed that you hide from God he already knows when did God send his son to die for us when did he do it did he do it after we believed well, no, obviously not. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. So if God's intention was to destroy you, he could have just had Jesus stay in heaven. You'd have done that good enough on your own. I'd have done that good enough on my own. But God knew us before we were even born. He knew us in our mother's womb. He knew the frailties of our flesh. He knew the weaknesses of our flesh, yet he sent his son and offered up his life as an atonement for our sins, as a propitiation. Just turn aside that wrath, turn it aside so that we might have the grace of God in our lives. So don't be afraid to come to the Lord. Whenever you have a need, come to him and he will receive you. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you 
very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by god to be a minister of christ jesus to the gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of god see this is all the way back to the beginning of his letter he's talking about this is all about god the gospel is all about god let me say that again the gospel is all about god it's about what god has done concerning his son and he calls us to believe he calls us to obey it's that simple none of us were better than one another not if we were an israelite or a jew or if we were a gentile before the cross of jesus christ none of us were better than one another and even after the cross none of us are better than one another we're all under sin we're all under the wrath of god we're by nature's object by nature objects of god's wrath so it's not that some were better than others or that some are better than others now no one's better than anybody else we all need the grace of god we all need the mercy of god we all need the salvation of god we all need the gospel of god and what is the gospel of god it's the gospel concerning his son and that's the gospel and paul identified delivering this gospel as a priestly service what does he mean by that well in the old testament they had what they called the levitical priesthood or the aaronic priesthood and all that means simply is that there was a guy named levi who had a bunch of children and one of his children was aaron and moses was one too and uh, god established the priesthood in the old testament through that family line so that's all it means by levitical priesthood it just means the priesthood that came from the family line of levi and the high priest was aaron so that became known as the aaronic priesthood because not just anybody could be the high priest that was determined by god so you know jesus didn't come in that priesthood he is not a priest in the order of aaron he is not a priest in the order of levi and we'll get to this later but he comes from another priesthood he comes from another line the priesthood of melchizedek that is the high priestly line of jesus and the apostle peter said in one of his letters that we as believers in the lord jesus christ are a kingdom of priests first of all we're in a kingdom we're not in a democracy we're not in a monarchy well i guess we are a monarchy we're in a kingdom okay i'll straighten myself out in the post edit (laughs) but we're in a kingdom we have a king the king is jesus but not only is he a king he's also a priest he is the intermediary the go-between the one who stands between us and God. And so as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are also a priesthood. It's called the priesthood of believers. We are not the high priest, the great high priest. Jesus is the great high priest. But just like the other Levites were priests in the Levitical order, you and I, everyone who has called upon the name of the Lord, everyone who believes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest of God everyone we're not talking about some kind of institutional religious thing here we're not talking about some kind of denominational structure here we're not talking about some kind of organization of man okay we're talking about the heavenly realm we're talking about spiritual reality and the spiritual reality is that Jesus is our king Jesus is our great high priest and we are priests of Christ we are priests in the order of Melchizedek serving the rest of humanity we don't get this yet as the church we we have got ourselves totally turned around we get angry at the world because the world doesn't believe in jesus we get angry at the world because the world doesn't stop sinning we get angry at the world because the world doesn't obey the law of moses and we get all upset and frustrated and angry about it but you see the world isn't supposed to serve us we're supposed to serve them And what are we supposed to serve them? The gospel of God, the gospel concerning his son, you see. You see, we make it all about our sin. But God dealt with our sin on the cross before the gospel was even preached. I want to say that again. God dealt with our sin on the cross before the gospel was even preached. And when the gospel was preached, what was preached is that God has sent his son born of a woman 
born under law to redeem those under the law so that we, both Israelite, Jew, and Gentile, so that we might become sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Yeah, but what about all this sin? Well, it was there before the cross, and God offered his son up as an atonement for that sin on the cross. Christ died on the cross. Everyone in Adam's race died on the cross with him. We died. Just as when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and disobeyed God, disobeyed God's command, and that one act of disobedience brought death to all men and brought sin into the world, that one act of righteousness by Jesus brought the possibility of eternal life into the world. It brought the possibility of forgiveness of sin into the world. It brought the possibility of being transformed from the image of Adam into the image of of God's dear son. And so Paul considered what he was doing in preaching the gospel to be a priestly service because he was serving the world with the good news. Do you hear that? With your heart, not just your head. He was serving the world with the good news of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And how does that happen? That happens when you hear the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believe. The Holy Spirit gives new birth to your human spirit. He places you into the the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, as the baptizer, immerses you, baptizes you into the body of Christ, and you receive the spirit of Christ to show that you belong to Christ. That's the new birth. That's the first part of your salvation. But then... The Heavenly Father, after you obey the gospel, after you believe the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the Father in heaven will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can live right inside of you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will live in you. And you'll learn how to walk in the Spirit. You'll learn how to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. You'll learn how to discern the Holy Spirit. You'll learn how to obey the Holy Spirit. You'll learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's the good news. That's the good news, that you can be filled with the Spirit of God, and you can know him right in here. You can know him. You can know the one true God. You can know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. The world can't give it to you, and the world can't take it away. You'll know that you know that you know that you know. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Paul received apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations, including us who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. The gospel is an announcement, a royal proclamation of the kingdom of God and its king, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. What it basically boils down to, friends, is God is saying, I have put my king in place. Stop serving everything else you've been serving. Stop living all the other ways you've been living. Stop serving other gods. Stop serving yourself. Stop serving created things and serve Jesus because I, God, the creator of all things, have appointed him as king and as judge over heaven and earth. And he's the one who's got the rules. We used to tell our kids that when they were real little, trying to teach them respect for authority. And then we'd we'd ask them in a certain situation, well, who's got the rules in this particular situation? Who's got the rules? Well, let me tell you something tonight, friends. God has the rules, and Jesus has the rules because God has appointed Jesus as king over heaven and earth. Not the Chinese, not the World Economic Forum, not the Pan-Africans, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not any other government on the face of the earth. God has appointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the king of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The obedience that God calls the Gentiles to is the obedience of faith. And let me say this to you tonight. And this is going to be hard to say and hard to understand, but let me say it to you because it needs to be said. I don't want to be misunderstood when I say this, but invariably I will because somebody will go off half-cocked, not listening to what I'm saying, 
but it isn't a call to obey the law of Moses. That is not the call. That's going backwards. That's going backwards under the law. It's not a call to obedience to the law of Moses. It's a call to obedience to Jesus Christ. It's a call to obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's a call to obedience to the Spirit of grace. That's another name for the Holy Spirit. That's one of his titles, the Spirit of grace. Eventually, we're going to get to Paul's letter to Titus, which was a personal letter. The letter we're reading right now is the letter to Romans, and that's a letter to an entire church. The letter to Titus, as the letter to Timothy, are letters to individual ministers that traveled with Paul, and they ministered under Paul's direction. And one of the things that Paul says in Titus chapter 2, and we'll get there, but when we get there, we won't use chapter numbers. (laughs) But one of the things that it says is the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us. Did you know that grace teaches us? Grace is a teacher. Grace is not just a state of being. Grace is the favor of God expressed through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this present world. That's the grace of God. And the grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live righteous, upright, and holy lives in this present age as we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what the gospel is about. It's not calling us to obedience to the law of Moses. It's calling us to obedience to Christ. It's calling us to obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's calling us to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's calling us to be led by the Spirit of God so that we are sons of God. That's what it's calling us to. And if anybody comes to you saying, well, the reason that uh, we're called is so that uh, we'll, we'll obey the law of Moses, they're lying to you and deceiving you, and you need to get away from them as quickly as possible because that isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, it just simply isn't. We've gone through many times, repeating several many times, what the purpose of the law is. The purpose of the law is not to make anyone righteous, not before the cross, not after the cross. The law of Moses does not impart righteousness. The law of Moses identifies sin. It identified sin before the cross. It identifies sin today. That's the purpose of the law. But the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. See, the grace of God doesn't bring knowledge of sin. The grace of God brings deliverance from sin. That's what salvation means. It means deliver. So the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Praise the name of the Lord. The obedience God calls the Gentiles to is obedience of faith, sincere belief, trust, and reliance on God that leads to corresponding. And let's talk about this salvation by works. What is salvation by works? Well, basically, salvation by works means that you attempt to present to God something that you have done as a substitute to be accepted by God in exchange or in substitute for what God has done. That's what salvation by works means. You say, no, I don't accept Christ. I don't accept the sacrifice on the cross. I don't accept any of that. I'm going to present God my own stuff. I'm going to present God my own works. I'm going to present God my own righteousness. I'm going to present God my own attempt to observe the law. I'm going to present that to God, and I'm going to expect God to accept me on the basis of what I have done. That is salvation by works. That doesn't work. Why? Because God has already set the standard. God has already set the plan in motion. God has already provided the means. He's already provided the way of salvation. And that way of salvation is through faith in his son. So there's nothing we can offer to God to substitute for that. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, that is the source of your righteousness. That is the source of your salvation. Living faith, faith that is alive, will have corresponding action. You see, because as we said just a moment ago, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all, to all men. It teaches us to do certain things. The grace of God teaches us. Well, number one, it teaches us because we've already been delivered from sin. We've already been, quote unquote, 
saved. Now the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, is teaching us. And what he teaches us is what we're supposed to do. And when we do what he teaches us to do, that is living faith. That is corresponding action. And that is what God has prepared for us to do. Everyone likes to to quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but they very conveniently leave out Ephesians 2, 10. And Ephesians 2, 10 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10 says this. See, this is the problem with verse numbers. That's why we're doing this as letters instead of books with chapters and verse numbers. This is one of the reasons right here. For we are God's workmanship. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Created by whom? Created by God. We believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are created by God in Christ Jesus, not in ourselves, not in our flesh, not in our mind, but we are created in Christ Jesus. And what are we created in Christ Jesus for? Right there in that same to do good works. We are created in Christ Jesus. We are God's workmanship created to do good works. So no, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace and we're saved through faith. But once we have grace and once we have faith, we have works. In fact, it goes on and completes itself by saying this, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, these works that we're to do after we're saved are sitting there waiting on us to arrive. They're sitting there waiting on us to arrive. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have that faith and we are saved, we are born again by the Spirit of God. We ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit and he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of grace that brings salvation begins to teach us what we should do. Then we start the work. We start the work because there's works to be done. So that's that part's done. So let's go on with our scriptures. Because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus then, not in himself, but in Christ Jesus then, he says, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, not because of himself, but because of of his reliance on the Lord because the Lord makes him competent as a minister of the gospel. Hallelujah. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. And once again, that is obedience of faith, obedience of faith to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Paul said he fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ by bringing people to faith. What we're supposed to do is bring people to faith. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been preached, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, Those who have never been told of him will see. See, those who have never been told of him. People don't need to be told they have a problem. People already know they have a problem. You don't, uh, yeah, okay, I have a problem. The gospel is an announcement. It's a proclamation of what God has done through his son. I mean, it's done. I remember back when I was associate pastor back in Terre Haute in 2008, we had a rapper come. And uh, he had a song he sang called It's a Done Deal. It's a Done Deal. And of course, he was a rap musician. And he was, he was awesome. He was really great. But I always remembered that song, It's a Done Deal. It's a Done Deal. It's something that God has done. It's not something that we do. Okay? So those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, 
since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you. Listen, we need to give to the needs of of our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Paul, you know, he made tents when he had the opportunity to make tents and supported himself in the ministry. But then there was other times where he didn't have the opportunity to make tents and he needed the help of the church. And we'll get to that in another letter when we get to that. But, you know, he says that you might help me on my journey. We should help ministers. We should help ministries, and we should help our neighbors. We, sh- we should help everybody. As the Lord puts people in our path to be a neighbor to, that we agape them. We, as- we have compassion for them to meet their needs. We take risks. We spend ourselves on behalf of them. That's what it means to agape your neighbor as yourself. It's an action word, not a, not a, a noun. It's a verb. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. So see, the other churches, even back then, were giving money to other churches and helping each other out. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. So what had happened is all of the promises that God had made to Abraham and the patriarchs that found their fulfillment in Christ now were offered to the Gentiles and they're participating in the spiritual blessings of Israel and now they have physical needs. The, the, The Israelite believers in Jerusalem, the Gentile believers in Macedonia and Achaia are sending money to help the poor members of the church in Jerusalem. And this is considered a good thing. This is something you should do. For if Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. So there it is, intercessory prayer. We should pray for one another. That I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Now he's getting really personal here in this part of the letter. He's, he's just about ready to wrap his letter up. And so he mentions certain people that he knows who are in Rome, who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So what does that mean? She contributed financially to Paul's ministry. She supported him in his ministry. She had that gift of giving. Remember, we talked about, you know, different gifts, those who have a gift to contribute. Well, obviously, Phoebe had a gift to contribute, and she exercised that gift in supporting the Apostle Paul in his ministry. Okay. Then, or sorry, greet Prisca and Aquila. Now, I think that is Priscilla and Aquila in some other translations. Uh, They're the folks that were tent makers with Paul in another letter that we'll read later on. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. So that shows you, you don't have to have a big, massive, ornate building to have church. You can have a church in your house. All you have to do is have people come together in the name of the Lord and worship in spirit and in truth and share each other's spiritual gifts, encourage one another, and and uh, mutually edifying one another. Now, there's nothing wrong with a building if you, if you can afford a building, but in these last days, I wouldn't be going into debt. I wouldn't be advising anybody going into debt for elaborate ornate buildings we we may be coming up on some very hard times i'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet and i don't believe conspiracy theories but i have my ears open and i listen to what's going on around the world and there's a very good chance that we may be coming into some troubling times and so i advise you to try to get out of debt as much as you can 
to owe no man anything except the continuing debt to agape one another. I think we led, read that earlier in the letter as well. My beloved Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prince prisoners. They are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trophina and Trophosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phleglon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them, Philogus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Hallelujah. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you go back and read the letter or you go back and listen to our podcast and notice the things that Paul points out that are characterizations, characteristics of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, what you'll notice is the pointing finger and malicious talk and gossip and slander and trying to pull people away and draw them away after strange doctrines and strange teachings and supposed revelations. That is not the way of Jesus. If anybody comes into your fellowship in your church and they start criticizing the pastor and they start, start criticizing the ministry and they start criticizing the teaching and they claim they have some new revelation or they have the correct revelation of this or the correct revelation of that in your church and your pastor is wrong, number one, talk to your pastor and elders about it because that person is coming in to do exactly what Paul was saying here. They are coming in to cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, avoid them, avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they sound impressive. They deceive the hearts of the naive. So beware of that. All right. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So did Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Aquartus, greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, not just to Israel, not just to the Israelites, but this has been made now to all nations, been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Listen to that there. To bring about the obedience of faith faith. That's what God is looking for in this day and age. That's what God is looking for from the world. The obedience of faith that everyone will come to the knowledge of the Son of God. They'll believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They'll believe on the Son of God. Be delivered from sin. Be transformed from the image of Adam into the image of Christ and have the knowledge of God in their hearts and in their minds. To the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. We just finished reading Paul's letter to the Romans, and I hope you've enjoyed this letter. 
we're going to continue from here. I think the next time that we meet, we'll probably start with the letter to Galatians. Because I think one of the biggest things that we need right now in the church is to really, really understand the difference and understand the relationship with, with the law of Moses versus the law of Christ. It almost seems like in the church today, the church has gone backwards to the law of Moses instead of living in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit in the law of Christ. And so we're going to continue with the letter to the Galatians, same way we've done the letter to Romans, no chapter numbers, no verse numbers. We're just going to read it just like a letter, and I hope that you will be blessed as we do. Leave some comments below if you have any questions or comments about the podcast, and uh, I believe in the description you might find a link to my YouTube channel if you'd like to subscribe to help get the word out about the podcast, share it with other people, use it in your Bible studies, use it, you know, uh, in your personal Bible study, use it in groups. Everything that I post online is free, and it is there for people to use to enrich their their lives spiritually and to help them grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think we're done for the day. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.